Caleb Benby, and I'll be your driver on this journey. Uh, today, I wanted to take a look at a pretty popular opening by the Black Pieces and what we can do to beat it with white. Of course, I'm talking about the Benko Gambit. It's a popular uh, response to D4, and it gets into a very unique type of position. Uh, it's the, the Benko Gambit is a pretty unique opening in that it, you don't see it really transposed into other things uh, a lot of the time, in, in the main variations at least. And so it's worth taking a look at, worth getting familiar with um, the Benko Gambit, because a lot of principles that you might have from other openings aren't really going to be super effective here. So you need to uh, take a look and see what the ideas are. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. So d4, knight f6, c4, c5. This is the key move order in the Benko Gambit. Now, if you're afraid of the Benko Gambit, there's a lot of things you can do. You can play a move like e3 if you want to avoid it, play even a move like knight f3. But of course, we're not afraid. We're, we're going right into it. So d5, b5, and I'm going to recommend you play the Benko Gambit fully accepted. That's right. You take all the free pawns, and then you're doing quite well. So we take on e a6. Now, black can recapture immediately, but perhaps the most accurate move order is to play g6 first. Um, now there's no real way for white to uh, defend this pawn comfortably, so you just play knight c3. Now, black will in fact capture on a6, and now after e4, bishop takes f1, king takes f1. This is part of the point of the Benko Gambit for black. He uh, makes white recapture on f1 with the king, and wastes some time uh, fixing his king here. Uh, so d6. Knight f3, this is all the main, main, main line, uh, bishop g7, g3, uh, black castles, white plays king g2, essentially casting by hand, black plays knight bd7, and then the line I'm going to recommend is the line that uh, was played in this game between Magnus Carlsen and Victor Bulligan, and uh, that line actually starts with the move 12a4. Uh, and it might seem a little bit silly to denote a line in the opening by the 12th move, but uh, up to this point, both sides have been playing really the, the main, main line. This is uh, really how the Benko Gamma goes with very few deviations along the way. There are some sidelines the black can try, but this is really the main setup of the Benko. Uh, knight on f6, this knight to d7, and then from here, uh, black has a few various options that we're going to look at today, but this is kind of our, our main starting position. And this move, a4, probably looks a little bit unnatural at first. You're giving up, uh, for example, this b4 square. And generally, when you see an a and a b pawn, the way they kind of get pushed is like a3, b4, and then you go from there. But the idea of a4 is really targeted at just shutting down black's counterplay. Uh, really the heart of the Benko Gambit is you give up this pawn on the queen side and in return you get these two nice open files and black tries to make use of the major pieces on these open files uh, in order to put pressure on the pawns to win the pawns back even and to just have a very very active play. Additionally this bishop on g7 is a very strong piece and it works quite well in tandem with those major pieces on these two files. So, how does that uh, relate to us playing a4? Well, we play a4 to take control of the b5 square. Now that we control b5, we might be able to plant a knight onto this square. And with this setup, we're aiming to get kind of a blockade on the queen side, so that these black major pieces actually don't have any way to break through. Uh, with that in mind, Magnus did not play uh, a4 in this game, instead he played queen e2. But now, after queen b6 and a4, we have actually transposed to, to the main line. Um, so, a little bit more natural of a way to get here is to play a4 first, then queen b6, and then queen e2. But it doesn't really matter um, how you get there in the end, uh, just so long as you get there. So, a4, and now rook f b8 by black is keeping in line with this strategy. And now Magnus plays the main move, the, the most natural move, simply knight b5. You shove this knight in the way of the black major pieces, and you uh, try to uh, keep him from, from getting in a, any counterplay. So with knight b5, it looks as though uh, white's blockade is going to be pretty, pretty difficult to, uh, to you know, dismantle. Uh, black in the game tried knight e8, which is still the main move, 
uh, white responded with bishop g5, also the main line. And now bishop g5, of course, is attacking this pawn on e7. So black has to defend it somewhere, somehow. King f8 is a main move. In the game, black played queen d8. And I did just want to briefly mention this sideline with h6. Just giving up this pawn on e7. But in return, this bishop gets a little bit stuck uh, on this e7 square. And so this is kind of worth taking a look at here. And there's uh, quite a few games. White ends up with a little bit of an advantage, I, I want to say. I like this move g4 in this position for white, uh, threatening to, to get the bishop out. I don't want to go too deep into this kind of crazy line uh, here today, but that's worth taking a look at. If you don't know any of the theory after h6, well, you can kind of simply just retreat this bishop back to e3 if you want, back to c1 even if you want, even back to d2 and give up this pawn if you like with some uh, counterplay on this queen side. Uh, but that's beside the point. In the game, queen d8 was played with a more normal kind of Benko looking, looking position. Uh, in the game, uh, white plays this move, rook a3. And this is a pretty strange, uh, strange looking move. Um, I would like to turn it over to the chat. I, I'd like to ask you guys if you can see the idea behind rook a3. Why was rook a3 played in the game? What do you think? Why rook a3 in particular? What is white hoping to do here? Does anybody have any idea? I'll give you just a moment longer. Rook b3 says Gil Wolf. Uh, rook b3 not actually going to be the main idea here uh, because the b2 pawn was pinned. That's actually uh, close to the truth. That is 100% uh, correct. Rook a3 unpins the b pawn, and that's a main reason for white playing rook a3. But why do we want to push the b pawn, and where do we want to push it to? You know, what's the what's the purpose? So yeah, you get out of the pin, but still protect the A pawn. But why do we want to push the B pawn? What do we want to do with it? It also does allow uh, ideas of doubling up on the A file, but that's a little bit beside the point here. The main reason we want to play rook A3, as you guys said, is because it frees up this B pawn. Uh, we allow this pawn to move a little bit, a little bit more freely. And in this case, we're looking to bring it to the b3 square. So, for example, if white continues with knight b6, uh, as was played in the game, we simply want to play b3. Uh, and this is a really good move for white for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it defends the a4 pawn. This is kind of the most natural idea. But number two, it controls a very, very important square in the Benko Gambit, and that is the c4 square. A very common way for black to kind of break open the white structure and get his pieces into the game is to play this move c4 and follow it up, uh, usually by bringing a knight to e5 and into d3, uh, things of this nature. In this case, though, the knight on b6 also pressures a4 with another idea behind the c4 move. It also breaks open another file uh, for these black major pieces to invade along, since white has done a very nice job of blocking up the a and the b files. So the c4 square is going to be a really crucial square for both sides in this uh, Benko Gambit. So b3 does a nice job of defending that pawn. So this is a really useful maneuver to keep in mind, bringing this rook up to a3 and following up with this move, uh, not b takes a3, but rather pawn to b3. Uh, so in the game, we did see rook a3, knight b6, and b3. Now, black plays this move, queen d7. And I would have actually liked to see, instead from black, uh, perhaps the move knight c7 uh, is required. This is a, a pretty common idea in the Benko. You need to get rid of this knight on b5 to activate the black pieces. So knight c7 is a good way to do it. White would probably capture and then play knight d2. Once again, it's all about this c4 square. And then from here, uh, it would still just be a game. Uh, the game would continue, but at least this powerful knight on b5 is kind of out of the way for uh, black a bit. 
Uh, but let's stick to what happened in the game. Queen d7 instead. Now Magnus plays the slightly strange looking rook a2, just to get this rook on a square where it's defended and allow it some more mobility. Now the move f6 comes on the board by black, kicking this bishop back to c1. And now black uh, kind of commits to a structural deficit here. He wants to break down the white pawns, but in doing so, he kind of sacrifices his own king position. But the fact is, he kind of has to. There's really no other way to go about playing here. Um, and that move that he plays is f5. Uh, so f5 really breaks open the white center, and this is a nice way for black to try to find counterplay. But as I said, it's, it's giving up a lot. It's really weakening the black king, and we'll see Magnus manage to take advantage of that. I did want to briefly mention, well, what happened if uh, black doesn't go crazy uh, with this f6, I f5 idea? And if that's the case, then probably still he should go back to this knight c7 plan. When we would take, play knight d2, and after a move like knight d7, like I said, if black is just playing naturally, white can play naturally as well. We bring a rook over to the b-file, and just as an example line, uh, something like this may occur. Knight takes c4, queen takes c4. And the fact is, white has totally consolidated and is just up a clean pawn. And now, I want to pause here for a moment and see if you guys can find the, the key idea for white to make use of this extra pawn. Uh, I would say white had sol has sol solidly left the opening uh, from this stage uh, and can, you know kept his extra pawn. But how can he make use of it? What is the key break in this position for the white player? What is the key break? And then, yeah, there's a question on rook a3 versus rook a2, so I'll, I'll jump back to there to uh, take a look at it. But here, what's the key way for uh, white to advance? Yeah, Gil Wolf has it. White's idea with this extra pawn is eventually going to be this move b4. So you can imagine a move like queen b6 maybe, and we could even respond with uh, b4 immediately. Uh, black could take, white could take, and at the end of the day, once we reach a position like this, it really well and truly is an extra pawn with no compensation for black. And the game is probably going to continue with white pushing this pawn up the board and then trying to make use of this bishop. And this should be a, a pretty easy game for white. Uh, I believe it's winning. It might not be the easiest win ever for uh, everybody out there, but you know you can't really ask for for more than a winning position out of the opening. So this example line was just to show how the game might progress if black doesn't really strike in the center immediately. If black is just taking his time, well, white's just going to bring his pieces over to the queen side and play for b4. This is your go-to plan once you kind of slow down the black rush of pieces, slow down black's attacking ideas. b4 is the way to advance your own plan if black hasn't really proven anything. Um, now back here, there was a question of why would you play rook a3 if you could just play rook a2 instead? Uh, and the answer is uh, a little bit tricky. Maybe this knight c7 idea actually grows in power a little bit. For example, takes and takes. And now, just for example, uh, it's a little bit difficult to play b3 without your rook on a3 because you're not defending it. And so you can imagine a move like rook b1 but now something like rook b4. And again, it's tough to play b3 because uh, you're running into some danger. So for the moment, it is sometimes useful to have this rook on a3 to defend this b pawn. But after knight b6, that defense of the b pawn is a little bit less required because this knight's a little bit in the way of black's own pieces, which is why Magnus was free to bring the rook back to a2. It's a good question, though. It's a good question. Um, so back to the game. Uh, black did not kind of sit back and wait for white to play very naturally and win in the classic Benko style. Instead, in this game, black plays this move f5 to challenge the white center. Uh, and now, tactically, this just ends up being pretty good for Magnus. Magnus takes on f5, uh, and black recaptures on f5 with the pawn. So what has black gained by this maneuver? Well, he's gained a weakness on the d5 square. What has black lost? Well, now... These squares around the king are just feeling a little bit open, and in addition to that, this backwards pawn on e7 might come under fire. For the moment, Magnus simply defends his d-pawn, and black plays knight f6, adding another attacker, 
And it turns out this is a pretty difficult attacker for Magnus to meet. It's true that Magnus could just play the move knight c3 and keep this guy defended, but perhaps he didn't want to uh, take such a passive role in the game. Knight c3 uh, is very good for white, don't get me wrong, but instead Magnus chooses queen e6 check to change the structure up a little bit. Black captures and white captures, and now we have uh, another change in structure here with white having this uh, very far advanced pawn on e6. Now it might look a little bit overextended, but the classic saying, as always, is it's only a weakness if you can attack it, and it looks pretty tough for black to get a hold of this one. And in addition to uh, being so far advanced on e6, attacking key squares, it also blocks off this pawn on e7 a bit, and really just ends up uh, winning this pawn by force. There's no way for black to defend this pawn, uh, as we see in the game. Black plays knight e4, and Magnus simply plays knight h4. And as I said, this pawn is just a goner. No real way to defend it. If you play a move like rook f8, you're just taking a little bit too passive of, a, of an approach. Stuff like a5, knight c7, and knight d5 are going to come and you're really, really on the back foot here. This is just kind of devastating. So black chooses to give up this pawn and plays c4, his key break. Uh, and while it's true that Magnus allowed c4, uh, at the end of the day, Magnus is winning this f5 pawn, and it's well worth it. Well, well worth it. So b takes c4, knight takes c4, and then Magnus actually throws in knight c7 rather than capturing the f pawn. Black gets a little bit tricky here, plays the move knight c3, forking the white rooks. So white takes a rook, black takes a rook, and now white retreats, black retreats, white saves his rook, black plays rook c8, and white brings the knight back to b5. Uh, and I don't want to talk too much about the specific of these tactics, the, the point of the lecture is kind of the Benko gambit, and here Magnus already has a winning advantage, so why don't we just see how he converted. Uh, black captured on b5, white captured, and now after rook c5, we see rook b3. Somehow, some way, black actually did manage to take this pawn. It was just never worth it to Magnus to, uh, to capture it. But the story of the game is really going to be this past b pawn. Once again, this is the classic way to win in the Benko. You keep your extra pawn, and then you push it in the end game and simply win. Uh, knight a5 was played. Rook b1 defends the bishop. Bishop d4. Now b6. Knight b7 to blockade. Uh, this rook comes up to b4. We see black tactically win a pawn back with this bishop move. Takes, takes, or sorry, takes check and then takes. But now after knight takes f5, uh, white is still up a pawn, and this is just dead lost. In the game, uh, black played knight c5, just giving up the knight after b7 and resigned. Uh, if he tries something else, like rook e1 for example, well rook c4 is going to be a really good move, threatening some checkmates and this rook is just going to invade. And if nothing else, we still have b7, just winning the knight. Uh, so, with all that in mind, Magnus won this game uh, pretty easily. There were some uh, pretty complicated, uh, complex tactics in there in the middle, but the point I wanted to get across is black went for this f6, f5 idea, trying to complicate things, but really, in my opinion, this was more of a last-ditch effort than an actual winning plan. Uh, Black saw that white had really consolidated over on the queen side. He saw that the, the moves of like c4 were never really going to get him anywhere, and white had a very nice lock on the position. So rather than just wait, sit back, and allow Magnus to do whatever he wants, uh, black tried this f6, f5 idea to complicate things. Turns out it just wasn't good for him. Uh, so that is my first introduction to the Benko here with this game. Uh, we see uh, white blockade on the b file and stop these black major pieces from getting through, and then black kind of panics, plays this f5 move, and ends up losing. Why don't we take a look at a slightly different variation in another game by some grandmasters. This one was between Alexander Lunderman, who now uh, lives in the St. Louis area, actually, and Belus. Of course, this game started with the Benko, and uh, we fully accept it, as I was saying. Uh, I also want to say, you know, once again, there really aren't too many deviations along this line for black. Uh, there's 1,300 games in this database that I'm looking at here, and uh, in all but seven of them, black captured on F1 here. So, like, really, 
this is the only line. And then in almost all the games, d6 was played. And then almost all the games, bishop g7 is played. And almost all the games, castle is played. And then knight bd7 is played, uh, almost always. And then we arrive at this position with 12a4, which, as I said, is kind of the starting position of this line in the Benko. Uh, so last game, we took a look at what happened after queen b6 and queen e2. And we saw that uh, white put this knight on b5 very, very quickly, played rook a3, played b3, and got a blockade. So in this game, black tried a slightly different setup, uh, playing the second most common move with rook a6. And this move looks slightly strange, but it's just a different way of ordering the black major pieces to put uh, a slightly different amount of pressure on the white queen side. And so we're going to see what the, the differences are here. With rook a6, black is actually telegraphing that he wants to play the move queen a8, doubling up actually on the a file. This is how he is putting pressure. So rather than the move we saw in the previous game with queen e2 to guard the e pawn, we're going to play the move queen c2 in this case. And this move just adds an extra defender to the a pawn, helps uh, pre uh, preemptively alleviate some of that pressure. Uh, queen a8 was played, and now rook a3 is still going to be the natural idea for white. Uh, rook c8 is now actually the move played in the game. And this move looks a little bit strange. You know, you might expect uh, black to bring the rook to the b file, but actually the move rook b8 would be a bit of a mistake here, I think, due to knight b5 when you have nothing better than to uh, guard this square again. I was going to say nothing better than rook c8, but rook, b rook b7 is probably a bit better. And the rook actually simply belongs on the c8 square, where it can help support the c4 break, as we've said already. Uh, white now plays very naturally, just brings this rook over to the d, uh, to the d file. And now black plays the move knight g4. And I did want to mention that in this position, it's still totally fine, totally playable to play a move like knight b5, but I think practically it just doesn't make quite as much sense here. Our goal with knight b5 uh, in the first game was to block off this b file, block down, lock down the b file pressure. In this case, black is not really pressuring down the b file, so I don't really see a need to play the move knight b5. And that's why I liked what uh, white did in this game, simply playing b3. Um, getting this part of our blockade up first, blocking off this c4 square, making sure that's not going to be a problem. Now the idea of knight g4 was to bring this knight to e5, and black follows through with that. White simply captures this knight, black captures this knight, and just develops this bishop. And I wanted to mention here that uh, in this game, black actually does get his key breakthrough uh, with c4. But I wanted you at home to try and figure out why this is still good for white. Why can white simply allow black to uh, play this key break with c4. What's the difference here? Why is this fine? Yeah, for grants, I'm actually going to take a look at a game in one of the in that line uh, a little bit later. Uh, this is still the main line, though. By by far, this is what is is normally played. I think this a7 line is still a little bit of a sideline, from my understanding. But uh, I'm going to take a look at one game that I actually played in that line. Uh, and yeah, this game was, was in the first Spring Classic here in St. Louis. So why did white allow c4? What's the difference? It gives black the d3 square. Yeah, this is why black wants to play c4, but why is white allowing it? Uh, and Gabriel has uh, one of the answers, and I think the best answer in this case and that is, white can play this move b4. And this is actually going to be really powerful for white, gaining these uh, protected pass pawns, uh, or connected pass pawns, rather. Black can get this knight onto the d3 square, but now we have a really key move here in the move b5, hitting this rook. Uh, the rook might come to a5, and then we can drop this bishop back. And really, at this point, these two pawns, uh, connected and passed, are going to be worth having this strong knight on d3. The game might continue, for example, something like queen b7, rook b1 to support the pawns, something like bishop e5, and now we might play a move like b6, and things like knight b5 are going to be coming onto the board, and it's going to be very, very uncomfortable 
for black to deal with. In fact, the C pawn might turn out to be a bit of a weakness after something like knight c7, when there's no good way to, uh, to defend this guy. Uh, in the game, though, white actually chose a different approach, and it really does highlight that the main point of c4, if, uh, if, for example, black isn't taking on the b3 square, the main point of it is, in fact, to get this knight to d3. And since Alexander Linderman knew that this was the main idea, he simply captured this knight, took it off the board, and then went about his play. Black inserted the move c takes b3, uh, and now after queen takes b3, bishop e5. It's true that black has opened up this c file, however, uh, white has now traded off some pieces, traded off this strong c4 pawn, traded off any annoying knights, and is simply just going to be up a pawn. Uh, it's hard to argue with this extra pawn in the Benko Gambit. The game continued with knight b5, and from here I will take a look and see how Alex managed to convert this position, but uh, I wanted to call this kind of the end of the opening, when white still just has a very nice advantage uh, with this extra a pawn. It's going to be a very, very pleasant endgame for white, if not winning. Um, there's a question, couldn't black just trade the bishop for the e3 knight? and capture the a4 pawn. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, do you mean in this case? Uh, I was saying bishop e3, and you were saying, uh, can black just take here? And uh, it's a good question. Tactically, though, this doesn't quite work out. We can take this pawn and uh, take this knight. And unfortunately, your, your rook on c8 is hanging. Good question, though. But tactically, uh, white is, is prevailing in that case. And I'm not sure there's really a good way to, to prevent this tactic from uh, happening to black. This rook kind of has to stay here, and you just don't have enough pressure on the a-pawn. Um, so bishop takes e5, and this is the position we had in the game. And Alex simply plays rook d2, the idea of probably rook c2 to contest the file. Rook a8 was played, uh, queen d3. And now, in this endgame, Alex eventually brings this rook over to the c file, and we see these pieces come off the board. And now after a5, uh, the end is near for black. I think perhaps a slightly better defense would be to stick this queen on a5 and try and blockade this piece a little bit further. But at the end of the day, it is just going to be an extra pawn for white. And in this pure endgame, it's really tough to say if it's enough to win or not, but uh, it's definitely going to be very, very good winning chances for, uh, for white here. Stuff like queen c4, and then you can re-out this knight, bring the queen to b5, and it's, it's going to be tough for black to defend. Uh, with that in mind, though, in the game, we saw a5, and now h4 from black is trying to get at the king, but simply a6, and now a7, and black has to divert the rook to stop the pawn, and after h3, there's simply not enough pressure on this king, and now e5 is the final move of the game, trapping this bishop on f6, uh, blocked by its own pieces and one white piece. And uh, that is where uh, Victor Belus resigned this position, uh, giving Lenderman the win. Uh, so this was just another classic Benko Gambit game where white blockades everything on the queen side, locks it all down with this a4 move, and then plays b3 to prevent the c4 break. And from there, simply converts up a pawn. And that is really all you have to do to beat the Benko. Let's say, uh, let's go with one more game here, uh, with another victor, Victor Laznica, this time against Vlad Christian uh, Gianu. In this game, of course, they played the Benko Gambit, believe it or not. We're taking a look at the main line once again. And just to mention, uh, someone was saying the main line these days is with Bishop G7, which allows White to uh, keep this pawn for the moment, with eventually playing an A7 move. And I think we're going to take a look at a game in this line uh, a little bit later. This is really the only deviation for black, is sometimes this bishop g7 move gets played. And there are some tricks to look out for in that line, but I'm focusing on, on the main line mostly for this lecture. Uh, and just for reference, bishop takes a, a6 played some 3,000 times, bishop g7 played around 600 times. So not quite as common, but bishop takes a6, e4, bishop takes f1, king takes f1, d6, knight f3, and we arrive at our main position here uh, after the move a4. Uh, black should play e6 and try to play on the long diagonal with the queen on a8. 
Um, that is definitely one idea, many, but there was really no uh, no way to go about it in, in the previous game. Um, so we have looked at queen b6 now. We've looked at rook a6 with queen a8 now. And last but not least, we're going to take a look at this line with queen a5 and examine some ideas here. Uh, so we're going to take a look at bishop d2 for white. Uh, the idea is simply you put the bishop opposite the queen and make life for black a little bit awkward. Uh, in the game, black played rook f b8, which is the main move. There are some other choices here. Black can bring this queen up to a6. Black can bring this queen up to b4. But the ideas are going to largely be the same. But rook b8 is played. Now knight b5. And black actually drops this queen all the way back to d8. Now, in the game, white played queen c2, keeping an eye on this e pawn, as always, and keeping an eye on this a pawn as well. The question of whether or not to bring the queen to e2 or to c2 can kind of be a tough one. Uh, the way I kind of think of it is in this queen b6 line, we bring the queen to e2. In the other lines, usually c2 is just a better square, keeping an eye on this guy uh, as well, keeping an eye on this b pawn, not being blocked off by this bishop. Uh, knight e8 was played in the game. Once again, this idea is sometimes to bring this knight to c7, also to just open up this bishop. Uh, in the game, rook a b1 was white's choice. And this is kind of the improvement of this line over the, the previous ones that we've seen. In the previous lines, white has had to play rook a3 in order to defend this a pawn and push b3. In this line, however, black only has one piece attacking the a4 pawn, and uh, white is actually free to just bring this rook to a better square on b1 before playing b3. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you can, bringing the rook to b1 is simply going to be better than rook a3. Uh, with good play, however, I don't think black should really allow this, this move order, and you should be forced to play rook a3, which is still not bad. Uh, knight c7 is black's choice in the game. Uh, white captures this knight on c7. Black captures this knight on c7. And then we see rook h to c1 from uh, white here. And once again, what do you think this move, rook h c1, is preparing for? What is white's idea to come? Is it a good gambit for beginners? It's a good gambit because it's, uh, it's a playable opening where black gets a playable position with some counterplay. Uh, for beginners, really, I think you can play just about anything at the beginning level. Uh, it's all about getting familiar with, with the chessboard, getting familiar with the pieces, getting that board vision up at the beginner level. So, um, Really, uh, at the beginner level, just, just focus more on playing good chess, keeping your pieces safe, looking out for basic tactics. Don't worry so much about the opening. Uh, Ronak Singh seems to have the answer. As does seventh novelty, as does Jean, as does oh uh, well, as does Hashem. And James says prepare for c4, not a bad idea. Uh, also keeping an eye on the c4 square. But of course, what we're doing is preparing for this move b4. This is what we want to do. And in the game, uh, Black simply allowed it with the move rook c8. And now this is really just going to be a tough position for Black after, of course, the move b4. And this is just going to be a substantial winning advantage for white already. Uh, Black's idea in the game was to play c4, and now what he wants to do is play the move c3. Why did white not play b4 already? The pawn was pinned. Let's take a look. If you play b4 in this position, uh, it's definitely a playable move, but you might run into the move uh, queen a7. I think this tactically is uh, not allowing you to keep these, these pawns connected. Uh, you have to do something with them, for example, a5, but now uh, black can, in fact, capture on, on b4. And you're down to just one pawn. This isn't bad for white at all, but uh, it's tough to find a line that's bad for white in the Benko Gambit. But uh, the point is you don't get this ideal setup with the pawns. This is why white played rook c1 in the game, to try and force that ideal setup. Uh, OK, with that in mind, uh, rook c1 in the game, now rook c8, and now b4. And now I guess you're asking me, what's the difference? Why not queen a7? Well, the answer is after a5, you can't capture this pawn because uh, this pin is actually going to be quite relevant. The two rooks would be quite powerful in this position. Uh, for example, bishop f8, 
or maybe knight f8. Uh, rook takes b4, and the rooks are kind of dominating. <clears throat> so b4, c4 was black's response, and now uh, white simply plays the move a5, getting these pawns rolling, already threatening to play this move b5, and it looks difficult to stop. Uh, black played the move c3, and now let me ask you, what do you think white played in response to c3? See if you can find it at home. See if you can find it. What is white's response to the move c3? Because this move seems to put a little bit of a damper on uh, black's plans, or white's plans just a bit. You're interfering with this bishop's uh, connection with these pawns on uh, b4 and a5, and that's going to make it a lot more difficult to uh, begin pushing them. So who thinks they see it? Who thinks they see it? Seventh novelty can't see it. It's unfortunate. Sometimes that's the way it goes, though. Sometimes that's just the way it goes. Oh my gosh. V. Dodenstein wants to play b5 immediately. Uh, the problem with this is not that the bishop's hanging, because of course there is this pin on the c-file. Um, although it does get a bit more complex after this move, but I think at the end of the day, Wait a second. Okay, at the end of the day, maybe it's okay for white with something like this, but uh, the problem I was going to say is that this pawn is also just sim simply hanging. Y you're giving up the A pawn by playing this line. So not B5. Um, Gilwolf wants to play Rook B3. Uh, this move does lose to C takes D2 uh, because there is now this idea with taking on C1. This is not a true pin. Uh, someone says e5, someone says queen b3. Uh, okay, let's, let's look at the e5 move. I don't really trust the c5 move. Uh, there's no need to give up your pawn here. Uh, and in fact, there is also still this line followed by taking this pawn. So be careful, guys. This pin might not be as real, realistic as you think it is. Okay, someone says queen b3. Um, that's not a bad move at all. But uh, maybe you're allowing c2 with some problems on the rook. My goodness, nobody has found it yet. Nobody. Nobody in the chat room. They've said almost every legal move, except the correct one. Uh, bishop e3 and bishop g5 are both okay. That's fair enough. Bishop e3, bishop g5, they're okay moves for white. However, they're not the best move. Um, like I said, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for white to push these pawns if it doesn't have this bishop to help along this diagonal. Um, and if you do play uh, bishop here, you, you are attacking this pawn, but are you taking this pawn? It's a little bit unclear. It's a little bit unclear. This bishop might end up trapped with some counterplay for uh, for black here. The best move, of course, nobody in the chat room found it. Maybe if you're watching this video after the recording, you found it. The move is, of course, you take the free pawn on c3, everybody. Free pawn is free. Uh, and the idea with this is that if you play queen takes c3, well, you're going to get met with the best move. Does anybody see the point? The best move? Well, okay. The best move has already been typed in the chat, I think in response to a different question. The move, of course, is queen a4, when after this line, uh, you're going to get destroyed by these pawns and this queen. And there's not much you can do about it. So uh, queen a4 was the idea with the point that you're on this file and on this knight as well. Uh, in the game, uh, if you play bishop takes c3, of course, I do want to mention, now rook b3 is working. This pin is realistic now. And uh, in the game, uh, black simply played queen c4, which is not going to get the job done either. So fun tactic there for white, uh, taking on c3 with this nice idea of queen a4. That being said, other moves, if you don't see this tactic, uh, that are fine. But queen d3 is also a very, very nice move. Uh, the point is you keep up this pressure on the c file, and you don't yet move this bishop off of this diagonal. And now maybe you are just simply, again, threatening to take on c3. 
Uh, bishop e1 is also the best retreating move for the bishop. I like it better than bishop e1 or bishop or bishop e3 or bishop g5 because once again you want you want this bishop on this diagonal so that it can really put pressure uh, on these pawns, meaning defending the white queen side so that these pawns are more free to push. You can follow up with something like rook b3 and just take this guy. Um, so some nice tactics there, but bishop takes c3, and after this the game really is over. Um, queen c4 was played. Now rook b3 defends the bishop. Uh, rook b8 by uh, black. Now queen b1 by white. And black does just capture. White goes ahead and captures. We see takes and takes. And now it's the queen against the two rooks. But more relevant that, than that are these connected pass pawns on the queen side. And that is why white easily wins this game after simply pushing the pawns up a bit and bringing the knight into c6. And now it's three connected pass pawns. And here, uh, black simply resigned this position, and white ended up winning. So once again, just another classic Benko Gambit win for white, where you blockade on the queen side, you bring your pieces over, and from there, you're just simply up a pawn, and you're going to have a good position. Um, key points to remember in this game. Uh, there's a question, however. Uh, so takes, we're saying takes, rook b3, rook b8, um, a6, well, okay, I mean, you can also just take this guy uh, like this, and after rook takes b4, rook c7, and all these pawns fall, and this guy is, is not going to fall either. Uh, for example here, um, let's see, yeah, simply rook takes c7 is probably good enough. Uh, you can take my guy, but uh, I'm starting to push. This end game should be lost. But maybe your move is good as well. A6 here also seems, yeah, it seems good. Seems good enough to me. Uh, okay, though. So key points to remember in this game. This key break, B4, is once again how white wants to continue after he is pretty much consolidated on the queen side. Step one in the Benko is making sure that the black major pieces don't break through. It's all about preventing black's play. But once you've achieved that, and it's time for you to uh, find some play of your own, this key break, b4, is, is most often the way to do it. This analysis makes the Benko look very unappealing. It is a very unappealing opening. I do not recommend it for black. <laughs> um, you get playable positions, but in these main main lines, it's just really tough. To show us some black wins, it's a good opening for black. Not if white plays well. Uh, then again, no openings are good for black if white play as well. Some are holding, though. Now, I want to take a look at a game of my own uh, in one of those sidelines. Uh, this was a game I played with my good friend, Eric Kurtz. Uh, we played it online, but it was a standard time control. We were kind of treating it as a training game, so we were uh, taking it rather seriously, uh, just for uh, some context to the game. And in this game, I played d4. My opponent played knight f6, I played c4, now c5, and we get the Benko Gambit. Now there was some talk about g6, knight c3, bishop g7, and so now we, we have finally arrived at this sideline, or main line, new main, whatever you want to call it, this other line for black here. Now in the game, I played e4, black went ahead and castled, and now see if you can find the move for white. There are a few moves here, but the move I'm going to recommend has a pretty nice idea with it. Mm -mm. I think Fragrance already knows the move. He's, he's talked about it previously in this lecture so far. Nice for black, perhaps in blitz games. I mean, it's, it's an opening, guys. You know, uh, it's, it's a more risky opening for black. It's definitely on, you know, the... Uh, as far as objective evaluations, it's on the lower end for black's responses to d4, but, uh, I mean, it can be fun, of course. White doesn't always play perfectly, like Magnus Carlsen. Uh, yeah, Fragrance knows both of the main moves. Uh, of course, the move I'm going to recommend is actually this move a7, and it looks slightly weird to spend a tempo to uh, move this pawn out of the way, but the idea is you draw this rook to a7 yourself, and now, uh, once again, a very common idea in the Benko is to play this move knight b5 in tandem with a4. And now, knight a5 is simply going to be coming with tempo. And this is why I don't really like this line for black as much as the main stuff, even though I do like the main stuff for white as, as well. 
Uh, a7 is a pretty good move to draw this rook to a square where it doesn't want to be. Now, in the game, uh, we continued with simply knight f3 uh, getting developed, d6 from black going for more of the, the standard Benko plans, bishop e2 by me, and now bishop a6 was black's choice, uh, still trading off this bishop. And now this is kind of the reason why uh, this line just doesn't leave a good impression, uh, even if, as my chat experts are saying, this is, quote unquote, the main way to play with black now. Um, it just seems as though you're getting a similar position to the first line, except in this case, uh, you're, you're wasting some time. Mm -mm. Uh, okay, so uh, white castled in this game, meaning me. Black played queen c8, which is a little bit of a strange move. Uh, more common in this position is simply developing the knight with knight bd7, but once again, we're just going to continue very naturally with moves like a4. Uh, keeping in line with the game, though, queen c8, uh, I played the move knight d2, the idea being I want to control the c4 square. Uh, bishop takes e2 was played, queen takes e2, and now queen a6 was black's choice. Now in the game, I probably should have tried to keep the queens on with a move like knight c4 or knight b5, both very natural moves, would have gotten the job done. I played rook e1 in the game, which I think is a bit of a mistake. Um, black should trade the queens here and go for a more end game type of uh, position. Uh, against these queen side pawns. Um, in the game, though, uh, that is actually what happened in the game. Uh, takes and takes. And now knight g4. But the ideas for white are still going to be largely the same here. Just because the queens are off the board doesn't mean you have to play too much differently in this case. So I played knight b5, rook b7, and now a4. This is still the best way for white to kind of blockade on the queen side and get these pawns up the board. Uh, knight a6 was my opponent's choice, eyeing this b4 square that I just gave up. But now simply knight c4, and this is a very nice hold on the position uh, by these white knights here. Uh, knight b4, rook a3 was my choice, with the idea that we've seen beforehand. Uh, rook a8 comes on the board by black, and now bishop f4 uh, was my choice, just getting the bishop developed, guarding this e5 square. And in the game, my opponent played bishop d4, putting some pressure on f2. I played this move h3. Um, note that knight takes d4 is actually a playable move here, but uh, it does look a little bit uncomfortable to allow this pawn to, to get to d3 like this. Uh, it is still fine for white, though. In the game, though, I simply played h3. And my opponent went in for knight takes f2, which turns out just not to be a, a good sacrifice. However, I do want to mention that white has already kind of achieved an ideal setup here uh, against the Benko. So my opponent was probably feeling a little bit uh, uncomfortable with the position, and if he had played a normal move such as knight e5, uh, well, I could simply take this. And after bishop takes, I probably don't even want to take this guy again. Uh, I could, but I, I don't really want to. You can just kind of expand on the king side now with, uh, with white, actually. Looking at moves like uh, f4, looking at moves like rook d2. And just for example here, um, just some improving moves. Maybe this. And something like f4 is eventually going to come on the board. And the point is that uh, white has totally locked things up on the queen side. So black cannot find any counterplay over there. And white's just a bit more free to do these kind of king side pawn pushes since uh, the queens are off the board. And so the king is going to be coming under less, less danger here. And white's just going to continue with moves like e5, uh, really breaking things open and uh, expanding. Um, that's what would have happened in the game if my opponent played a normal looking move like knight e5. Instead though, knight takes f2, and now, uh, now this is just simply winning for, uh, for white, I believe. Um, I chose knight takes d4 in the game. Um, knight takes h3 was my opponent's response. Uh, much better was actually to bring this knight out to d3 when you are gaining a tempo on the bishop, so you're not losing a full piece, but it is still looking rather rough now that these pawns are kind of unopposed with this c pawn missing. It's kind of as though white had played b4. Not quite, because this square is still going to be a stronghold for black, but without the c pawn, it's, it's going to be very tough for uh, black to hold this. 
Um, in the game, though, knight takes h3, g takes h3, and now white's simply up a piece, and the game quickly concluded. Um, well, okay, this was a little exchange sack by me, but I was already up material, so giving some of it back didn't really change anything. And now uh, the game was once again decided by these extra pawns on the queen's side. And here my opponent actually resigned. So once again, this is another example where uh, once white gets this nice blockade on the queen's side, the point is black just doesn't have a lot to play for. That's why priority number one in the Benko is always, always, always preventing black's queen's side counterplay. If you can achieve that, then you really have all the time in the world to figure out what you want to do on other sides of the board and end up uh, winning the game with these ideas like b4. Or in this game, with the queens off the board, it also gave white this uh, other idea, if black had played normally, of eventually expanding on the king's side with things like f4 and even something like e5 to, to follow. Um, so. Another disaster for Black and the Benko. You got that right. The Benko is full of disasters. So I wanted to open it up now to uh, any question you guys you guys had on the Benko, and then I was gonna go through uh, these games once again and just review some really key points. Where did Black go wrong? Uh, that's a good question. Where did Black go wrong? Well, he just played some slightly strange moves. Like uh, Queen C8 here was not the main move. It has been played before, and then from here takes was good. Knight G4. Perhaps this maneuver was just a little bit flawed in this case. Uh, maybe better uh, is bringing this knight out to d7, bring this knight out to b6, and uh, playing on this side of the board once once again. Although I don't think he's he's that much worse in this case. Um, here, even I think things are still fine, but uh, yeah, knight e5. This would have been a, a better way to play, I think. Um, and white does have a slight edge here, and he does have these planes of expanding in the center, but uh, black's definitely still in the game here. It's not, not as though white is just totally winning. Black lost the moment they chose the Benko. You got that one right. You got that one right. Mm. I always win Benoni slash Benko. Doesn't matter which color. Why, though? I, I don't know, Silas. That's going to be a question you have to answer for yourself. Maybe you just really understand these positions. So the key ideas I wanted you guys to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, the main idea of this line, um, the main line, is to bring a knight to b5 and bring a pawn to a4. This is what I like white uh, to be doing in the main line. This is how you prevent black's queenside counterplay. This is how you uh, gain this blockade to make black's life difficult. And in this game, we achieved it with the queens off the board which isn't always ideal for white. Black is actually sometimes pretty happy to trade the queens. But we saw it in this game, we saw it in this game, always this blockade. We saw it in this game, this blockade. We saw it uh, even in this game. We saw it in all four of these games. Uh, this is a really nice idea for white to block off the queen side. Now, uh, beyond this, you want to prevent black from playing the move c4 in all cases. In this case, this is why white set up with this move b3 to prevent c4, and eventually brought this knight back to d2. It's all about preventing c4 for black. This is black's break to find counterplay. And then beyond that, the, the final way to uh, kind of win once you've achieved your uh, blockade is, once again, this break b4. Once you neutralize black's counterplay, you want to play b4, breaking open on the queen side, and pushing your pawns to victory. Uh, well, that just about does it for me tonight. Uh, looks like you guys don't have too many other questions. Why do people play it if it's so bad? Well, I've, you'll have to ask a Benko player. It does give some practical chances if white doesn't know what they're doing. Um, even sometimes if white does know what they're doing, but just has a bad game. Uh, but okay, that does just about do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me this week on the Road to 2000. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.